Thank you, Vera. So, uh, in my presentation, I will talk about the ideological and the emancipatory functions of education. What I found interesting was how, on the one hand, education can work to reproduce the existing power relations, assimilate and indoctrinate students, but how, on the other hand, it can also work to liberate, emancipate. So, in the course of this presentation, I will try to disentangle these two functions and to point at what exactly the emancipation would amount to, and in particular today. I will start with a brief historical overview. It's not working again. Can you change it? Okay, thank you. Um, with a brief overview of the historical examples from European history of ideology and emancipation in relation to education, but also taking into account broader social context to help clarify these concepts themselves. First, uh, ancient myths, customs, and religions may be called proto-ideological insofar as they serve to justify and preserve social privileges of the higher classes. Of course, they're not merely ideological since they also served other important functions. Second, if we take ancient Greece for, as an example, I believe we can contrast the Ionian philosophy, the sophist and the Athenian education on the one hand as emancipatory with the Spartan education as belonging more on the ideological side, while the former nurtured the spirit of free thinking, research and debate within certain limits, of course, the Spartans were committed primarily to teaching new generations the traditional values of their community so their education had certain traits of indoctrination, at least from today's perspective. Well, of course, we should mention the message of early Christianity that was radically egalitarian and emancipatory for the lower social classes. Christianity left a profound mark on Western education and had both emancipatory and ideological effects. Uh, then, by tracing the history of universities, we also come to see the double nature of education, both emancipatory insofar as the universities have pushed the limits of knowledge and served as places of critique and resistance to the dominant ideology, but have also very often been occupied by the dominant ideology or served as a stage for ideological conflicts. The Renaissance marked the beginning of a long period of breaking with scholasticism, and an increasing trust in the autonomy and the authority of reason. Index Librorum Prohibitorum, the attempt on the part of the Catholic Church to ban the spread of new religious ideas, new scientific knowledge, and new philosophies can serve as an example of how the dominant ideology of the time clashed with the new emancipatory trends tending towards freedom of thought and research. 17th and 18th centuries witnessed the flourishing of new liberal emancipatory political ideas, professing equality, freedom, and natural human rights, as well as the call for liberation of thinking from old, mainly religious prejudice, especially in the age of enlightenment. Education was recognized as the way to accomplish the progress of the entire humanity guided by reason. The 19th century saw the continuation, but also the transformation of the emancipatory trends of the Enlightenment. Emancipation gain, gains its contemporary meaning in the 19th century, liberation from domination and the attainment of freedom and rights. Its earlier meaning was tied to the Roman law and the legal emancipation of children and wife from pater familias. familias. Now the concept started to be used in the context of gaining religious freedoms, for example, Catholic emancipation in the Great Britain and Ireland, and the liberation from slavery, proclamation of emancipation of the 1863. The word ideology also has its origin at the start of the 19th century. It was coined by the French intellectual circle of ideologues to designate the new science of ideas. This movement aimed precisely to perfect humanity through the national system of education by passing the ideas of the French Revolution on to the new generations. Two major new ideologies emerged in the 19th century, socialism and nationalism, and they both led to revolutionary and in many ways emancipatory social transformations. Education was increasingly seen as serving the national interests rather than emancipation of the entire humanity. As the states recognized the need for educated subjects, 
the curriculum moved from liberal arts towards more practical subjects and specialized education for professions. We should also mention the new emancipatory pedagogical ideas as represented by Pestalozzi, Frobel, and the philosophers of Bildung, influenced by Rousseau, uh, they stressed the need for free and creative development of children with the aim of forming autonomous and complete human beings. Finally, we reach the 20th century with the totalitarian ideologies and the grave abuses of human life, rights, and freedom, and towards the end of the century, with the almost global dominance of capitalism and the neoliberal ideology. So now I would like to draw some conclusions from this historical overview. Uh, first of all, I wanted to show how complex the links are between ideology and emancipation in general. Namely, emancipation and ideology are not simply diametrically opposed. Historically, what has been emancipatory had its ideological elements and vice versa. This also applies to education. We cannot claim a simple dichotomy between ideological and emancipatory functions of education. What we call ideology today often used to be emancipatory in the past. However, we could say in general that educational trends that lead to the spread and broadening of knowledge and education, to the more equal distribution of it, and to more freedom of thought, were also more emancipatory. On the other hand, in so far as students were expected to simply accept certain values and belief systems, and in so far as education serves to justify the existent hierarchical power relations, it serves an ideological function. Also, we should note that the concept of emancipation itself that we can form based on these historical examples is twofold. It has the sense of gaining new rights and freedoms for the oppressed social groups and classes, but it can also be understood in a more personal sense of becoming an emancipated individual, able to freely form opinions and make decisions on the grounds of knowledge and reason. Having all this in mind, I believe we should still criticize ideology, precisely as opposed to emancipation. I propose to do this by making a distinction between ideology and ideal. Like I said, we should take note of the fact that historically what started as ideal often became ideology, unreflected, enforced, serving to justify the existing social order rather than to question it and possibly change it. In schools, this amounts to simply studying content, especially social norms and values, as a given. Nevertheless, old ideals, even when turned to ideology, keep their potential to yet again become reflected, enlivened, given a, renew emancipatory, a renewed emancipatory meaning. What distinguishes ideal and ideology is not primarily their content, but rather their function in a society. Unlike ideology, ideals serve precisely not to preserve the existing order, they are striving towards a different future. Now, I would like us to take a look at three emancipatory educational ideals that I think can still show us the way today. Uh, first is the Renaissance ideal. Emancipatory function of education becomes increasingly recognized in the Renaissance when an educational ideal modeled on the antiquity is formulated, striving towards perfection guided by reason, developing the rich potential of human beings to the fullest. The ideal Renaissance man is a polymath, homo universalis, the one who can excel in many skills and fields of knowledge. One of the main goals of education was civic virtue for which it was considered necessary to possess eloquence, erudition, and breadth of view. First, gymnasia were founded at this time, and the curriculum was broadened to include new topics, the humanities, history, literature, and poetry, ethics, Greek, etc. In contrast to the rigidity the and logical formalism of scholastic education, the pedagogical literature of the time advocated teaching methods aimed at arousing the interest of students by appeal to emotion, moral message and beauty of style. In the Renaissance, the emancipatory value of humanities for development of personality was recognized, was recognized, something that creators of education policies today are often losing the sight of. Okay, so the second educational ideal, 
that I want to touch upon is the ideal of the enlightened. I will focus on several main points from the two key texts, Rousseau's Emile and Kant's What is Enlightened. Uh, Rousseau formulates the Enlightenment ideal. Just a second to see. Oh, this is Kant. Rousseau formulates the Enlightenment ideal as the liberation of human nature from the shackles of society. However, as noted by Dewey, this doesn't mean a society in general, but the corrupt society of the old regime, which Enlightenment philosophers wanted to overcome in the name of freedom and equality for the entire humanity. Emil is an ideal member of a society of free and virtuous citizens, the only one suitable to bring about Rousseau's idea of social contract. The main purpose of education for Rousseau is a negative, to keep Emil away from corrupting effects of society in order for him to be able to enter society as a free man. The main emancipatory message of Emil is that children should be raised to be free which they by nature already are, their freedom being taken away from them in a society of false social values and corrupt institutions. I want to single out one claim Rousseau makes as particularly important. Rousseau argues that we should shape child's character so that it becomes neither a slave nor a master. Children should never be taught to be servile through subordination of their will. On the other hand, they should also not be taught that they have the right to dominate the others. They should be taught to treat other human beings as equals. Similar to the Rousseau's ideas, similar to Rousseau's ideas, Kant also argues that men should neither be slaves of others' will or of outside passions, but free subjects that freely submit to their own will. Sapere out have the courage to use your own understanding is therefore the motto of the enlightened, says Kant. Men free by nature are in the state of subjugation when instead of using their own reason, they allow themselves to be guided in their opinions and actions by the self-proclaimed tutors. Kant is however aware that the emancipation of humanity can be achieved only gradually under the condition that a free public use of reason is allowed. Free public use of reason means that everyone can freely criticize and take a stand on public matters, especially regarding the issues of state policies and religious postulates. In this way, enlightened individuals, individuals those who have already freed themselves from self-imposed non-age, will spread the same spirit of freedom and rationality to others. Kant's vision of the progress of humanity should ultimately lead to the universal enlightenment. Freedom of thought prepares the ground for civic freedom. As this quote here says, I will just like to read it. Both for Kant and for Rousseau, emancipation has its individual and its social aspect. It is an achievement of an individual striving towards freedom and virtue, but this is truly possible for all only in a society based on the principles of reason, freedom, and equality. Individual emancipation is considered necessary for the liberation of the entire society and vice versa. Going on to the critical pedagogy now, um, with Paolo Freire, the founder of the critical pedagogy, we find preserved these basic ideas of the Enlightenment. Key novelty of Freire's pedagogy is struggle. The society of equality must be fought for. It will not come of itself. Emancipation takes place in the process of this struggle. In his pedagogy of the oppressed, he focuses on the role of education in the struggle for emancipation, understood at the same time as the struggle for a more humane society and against the society of domination in which both the oppressor and the oppressed are dehumanized through this relation. Many aspects of Freire's critique of education can be applied today. The overwhelming tendency to understand the process of education as a transmission of knowledge from teachers to students who are expected to merely adopt and reproduce it is what Freire calls the banking model of education in which knowledge becomes petrified, lifeless, and isolated from the world. The result is passivization and dehumanization. 
Knowledge that students gain in the banking model is meant to make them obedient clerks in the existing system. It doesn't question existing norms or it does so only in the abstract and insists on inessential contents. According to Freire's Marxian critique of education, explanation for this is to be sought in relations of power. Dominant social group, which de facto has power in, in the society, adjusts social order to its own interests and needs representing them at the same time as universal and natural. In such an order, the oppressed should be taught obedience, they should learn knowledge and skills that have value for the oppressors. Thus, the immediate interest of the privileged in the existing hierarchical order is not to entice free questioning and critical thinking, especially not among the oppressed. Furthermore, dominant ideology is so woven into an everyday way of thinking that even well-meaning teachers often unconsciously fall into the patterns of teaching which contribute to the reproduction of the oppression. The central task of Freire's emancipatory pedagogy is thus the critique of ideology. Instead of teaching them to adapt to the unjust world, the main task of education should be to entice students to fight for a more just world. Emancipatory pedagogy aims at transformative action directed at freedom and equality for the oppressed, and in this way for the entire humanity. The role of education is to liberate students from the ideological consciousness in which the existing social relations of are falsely represented as necessary. Education should show to the students that human being can change the world and create a new one. In giving up that freedom and that potential, man willingly accepts unfreedom and remains a well-fed cog in the machine. Freire's emancipatory ideal demands also the change of relation between teacher and students in the direction of more egalitarian, dialogical and problem-posing education, similar to what we find in Socrates. Dialogue, true communication, in which teacher and students are partners in research as opposed to one-sided monological relation, is the proper medium of emancipatory education, because it invites students to think autonomously from the start. And, um, Oh, these, are, these are the quotes about dialogue and ideology, Freire's quotes. Uh, and now to conclude, no, it's okay. It's okay. Uh, moving on to the question of what could be emancipatory in education today. Uh, so uh, I believe this quote behind, <laughs> behind me and nicely sums up most of the problems with education posed by the contemporary capitalist ideology. The return to shallow understanding of science, the search for technical solutions based on this misunderstanding of science, a new managerialism that relies on the massiveness of the resurgent regime of measuring anything that moves in classrooms, the reduction of education to workplace skills and the culture of the powerful. These are things that are not fictions. We are facing them every day, sponsored by a government that seems intent on giving everything that ordinary people have struggled for over to the most powerful and often simply rapacious segments of this society. This must be stopped and education has a role to play in stopping it. This is a quote by Michael Apple. Contemporary educational systems are devised with a compromise in mind. On the one hand, it is taken as a given that all children should get quality education that is not reduced to learning professional skills. On the other hand, creators of educational policies are calculating with the number of educated professionals, depending on the predictions of demand on the labor market and possibilities for economic growth. The economic criterion wins over, so the primary role of education today is mostly tied to the preparation of children for future careers or employment. Uh, what now I'd like to ask or to offer a proposal of what could create potential lines of resistance to the contemporary dominant ideology. I will point out several emancipatory tendencies that draw on the educational ideals I just discussed. Clearly questioning, problematizing, and critical thinking still turn out to be the main barriers to the ideological function, both in terms of individual emancipation and the change of existing relations of power. Non-ideological education is the one that offers reasons and allows for questions about the statements that are being taught. Critical thinking can be understood in two main senses, logical and socio-critical. 
Logical sense involves educating thinking to be guided by reasons, to autonomously assess evidence, to be able to formulate valid and recognize invalid arguments. Sociocritical sense involves disclosing unreflected social prejudices that are considered as self-evident, social injustices and relations of power that are represented as necessary and unchangeable. Enhancing critical thinking in both of these meanings is the first emancipatory trend which can empower students to think autonomously. In addition, as pointed out by Freire, critical thinking must go hand in hand with the development of the capacity for action. This trend is opposed to the contemporary apoliticalness of education. Even when politics is an explicit topic in class, political action, possible role, and the responsibility of students in recreating and changing the social world are usually not in the focus. To encourage students to change the world and to warn them against possible ideological and demagogical manipulations in the political sphere, to enable them to defend their own and common political interests and rights if these are under attack is in today's context one possible line of defense of freedom. Students should be aware that they are also political subjects that have the right to demand and organize for social change. Emancipatory education today would be the one that actively entices students to get involved in the transformation of the world together with others in the spirit of freedom and equality. One more important dimension of this is also to nurture equality and solidarity among students and between students and teachers as a way of resisting the trend of competitiveness and hierarchization. Education should not give up on the important ethical message that people should be neither masters nor slaves to each other because equality is the necessary condition for a society that respects freedom of all. And finally, empowering students to think critically in the neoliberal world means encouraging them to have interests beyond technical skills needed for a profession, which would certainly make them useful, but not necessarily autonomous members of society. Insisting on non-useful subjects in the curriculum, such as arts and humanities, is another way to emancipate from the dictatorship of the market. That doesn't mean that education should completely neglect professional skills, but it does mean not giving up on another more significant goal of education, not to produce good workers for the capitalist market, but to teach people how to be free, how to think, form values, and act autonomously with others as equal free human beings. Thank you.